everyone. Welcome to another episode of Debatable with your hosts, Nina and Kyle. I'm Kyle. I'm Nina. And for this episode of Debatable InterVarsity's post-debate analysis, we're joined by Miko Bombeo, an MPDC grand finalist, and my good friend, as well as someone who is very single and ready to mingle. I already said this, but I feel like they'd want me to say it again. Hi, Miko. Welcome to the show. How would you like people to know you by, especially for the theme of fellow? I mean, okay, first of all, if I'm still single by the time this episode comes out, I'm going to be really sad. But second of all, hi, I'm Miko Bombeo. Um, I'm a self-proclaimed philo fan. I'm kind of a fake philo fan because I'm not really familiar about all those philosophers and the things that they study. But sometimes I like to lay on my bed at 3 a.m. and reflect on life and why life sucks. And I guess that's what matters when you're a philo fan. Yeah, and to be honest, you, you can't really ask for anything more for philosophers. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that is the basic requirement to be a philo fan. So in your opinion, what makes philosophy motion so unique or fun? If, if you're a fan of debating philosophy motions, what is it about those kinds of motions that draws you to them? Just so that like other people can understand it as well. The reason why I love philosophy motions so much, and people who I've partnered with before can attest to this, is because you can get as creative as you possibly can. And I feel like philosophy motions also target a lot of things in life that aren't necessarily that evident. So we have a lot of IR motions that talk about international conflicts. We have a lot of econ motions that talk about the stability of the economy and stuff like that. But when it comes to the realities of life and how we as human beings feel and interact and form our identities, we don't really get to see that on a wider range in terms of discussion. So I feel like philosophy motions are unique because they bring those vague things into the spotlight and make people introspect as to why these things are important, not only in their lives, but in the lives of other people as well. I like to say that whenever... a philo round ends, people learn something new about themselves, even a little bit. The motion is about preferring a world where the idea of a collective unconscious does not exist. Now, this motion does have an info slide, but Miko, would you like to explain basically what a collective unconscious is first? Okay, so the collective unconscious is basically a body of knowledge that contains every single human experience up until that person's birth. So before you're born, people experience things like, you know, wars and like strife and difficulties in life all around the world. The theory um, basically says that when you're born, there is a part of your subconscious that contains all this information, the good and the bad. So there's positive things like charity and like, you know, nice things and values and kindness, but also negative things like xenophobia, racism and sexism and homophobia. And it talks about how a significant, albeit small part of the subconscious isn't actually something that is formed by an individual, but is actually something that's genetically inherited. So what's interesting about this is that while the theory does exist, this is the first time I've encountered it personally. And I wanted to ask what inspired you to bring this idea into the debate sphere? What made you want to hear people discuss this motion in particular? So my main thing as a philo fan is um, the question of whether or not a life that isn't experienced exclusively by you is a life that's actually lived by you. Um, And this motion is actually inspired by one of the papers that I did back when I was a first year college student uh, studying AB psychology. So I was doing a paper that was basically talking about uh, the collective awareness, which is a higher form of the collective unconscious that people get to access and people get to understand. Um, And the collective unconscious was one of the resources that I actually used in order to make that paper. And I thought to myself, this could be an interesting point of debate because if the collective unconscious exists or did not exist, what type of life would people be living? Would people be born as blank slates? Would people be incentivized to create meaning out of their life given that they know that some part of them some deep, dark, evil part of them believes in the things that they are adamantly against? Or will people just go through life and think that every single value, every single thing that they choose to pursue is a result of their own interests, their own like wants and needs, and not necessarily something that was 
pre that they were predisposed to like pursuing. I also wanted to ask why was this theory created to begin with? And I'm not saying like oh because it's just there. I- I'm saying like put it in the context of the society within which Carl Jung was living. Why was the collective unconscious thought of to begin with? What purpose was this theory meant to serve? So the interesting thing about Jung is that he's not actually a philosopher. His, he's more of a psychologist. So this theory was made in terms of understanding or like becoming a part of the theories of personality, which is basically theories that um, form the personality of an individual or like things that the personality of a person can be based on. And this was one of the theories that did not gain that much clout, but was still something that was heavily contested on a psychological level because it assumed that um, and it put into the whole nurture vers- versus nature debate on how people have inherent inclinations towards things. This put the whole entire information of the world before your birth into a part of your subconscious that you generally cannot access, but still influences your actions and still influences the way that you act. So this theory was created in order to try and understand why people have inherent inclinations. I think it was also used to try and understand why psychopaths end up up becoming psychopaths or why serial killers have an inclination to harm or abuse um, animals at a young age. And what's sad is that this theory wasn't fully explored for it to be proven or for it to be di- like disproved. I don't know the term, but like unproven. So the theory just exists in the ether of psychological theories that haven't been explored yet. And I felt like, what if the debate community can explore this theory and try to uncover the secrets behind the collective unconscious and what it represents? So just to clarify about this debate or this motion, it says that we should prefer a world without the idea. So this motion does not assume that there is truth to the theory. So am I correct in understanding that in this motion, it's basically about like what this theory, this unproven theory is doing to our social dynamics? Yep, that's correct. I think that the reason why it's framed as preferring a world without the idea is because human beings are inherently inclined to try to explore ideas and to a certain extent even project ideas into reality. So even if things aren't proven, like let's say astrology or tarot readings, for example, People want to believe that they're real. People want to believe that something like that exists, that an otherworldly being like the universe is controlling the day-to-day of their lives. So an idea of a collective unconscious that has the world's knowledge before you were born existing in your brain is something that can alter the way you as a person interact with other people, as well as alter the way people perceive psychoanalysis, people perceive values in terms of like life, in terms of meaning, in terms of how they create ethics out of things. And I feel like that's a really interesting concept to explore. So not only so, not only does something existing contribute to how valid it is or how um, like how it affects our lives, but the very idea of it existing or not already has a direct impact as to how we operate on a social like on like on a societal level. Yeah, so I find it really interesting how you mentioned the ways by which the collective unconscious has been used in society as well as how a lot of individuals in the the psych field have been trying to uncover it. My question now would be, like particularly for this motion now, if you were in government, how would you frame the collective unconscious to be something that is regrettable? Given that based on the conversation we've already been having, it seems to be a rather neutral belief. But how would you tip the scales to make it negative in nature? So first, I personally would probably frame it as human beings being a naturally curious entity. And I would use that and analyze that in ways where that curiosity has gotten the best of us. So for example, when we explore the ideas of nuclear power, when we explore the ideas of um, the power that you get when you become elected into a position, it, it usually leads to something negative, like nuclear bombs being created, corruption in the government, etc. But what happens if you take that curiosity and apply it to something that is generally not that proven or something that you have to con- you have to constantly discover. Um, and I think that's what I would frame it in government first. 
how the how the collective unconscious pushes people into a position where they would be constantly finding or constantly trying to discover what their personal collective unconscious holds, what type of knowledge it has. Because when people have that idea that they can access this huge body of knowledge, more often than not, they're going to find every possible way they can in order to access it, in order to find truths about the world, in order to find truths about why they act a certain way, or even just to understand fully what the human experience was before they were born. And that can lead to a lot of negative outcomes, if you think about it, because that person is equipped with a huge amount of knowledge, yet no mechanism in order to control how that amount of knowledge impacts them. So you can talk about things like that person creating conspiracies about the world, or even that person using that knowledge in order to gain power if they were Um, in a position where they could use that knowledge to their advantage. And the idea of the collective unconscious, even though it is a neutral entity, is that it can necessarily tip the skills in a way that directly affects people um, negatively, basically, or like directly affects people in a way that debilitates their ability to determine that the things that they've achieved in their lives are exclusively their own. If you discover that the collective unconscious forced you or actually influenced you to pursue things such as like your course, for example, or caused you to have certain problems in your like mental state or even in your family, that can serve as a detriment towards you trying to identify yourself in a world where people are constantly finding themselves. You lose your ability to discover who you are or where you stand in the world, for example. I actually didn't think of it like that. I didn't go so far into the idea that people would actually actively try to access the world's information, like like the avatar or something. So that was incredibly interesting to me. But given that this motion is about preferring a world without a particular idea, how would you suggest governments to like run this from like a technical point of view? Like, should they give an alternative or if they have to give an alternative world, how would you, what would you propose for this debate? I feel like the best alternative for this motion is to just stay with status quo um, where people aren't necessarily aware that the idea of a collective unconscious exists, um, but it's taken to the extreme where the idea actually doesn't exist. Um, and I think that's because if the bulk of the argumentation of opposition would revolve around, let's say, allowing for people to discover this, or like if the harms of government would revolve around people being uh, realizing that their lives aren't actually their own, then the solution would be to allow people to live in a state of not necessarily ignorance, but also a state where they can own the things that they have achieved, that they have experienced. Um, Everything that they are as a person can be um, attuned or like attributed to their personal human experience and not a result of some twisted collective unconscious that drove them towards those choices and drove them towards the identity that they're trying to achieve for themselves right now. I think that setup would generally be fair enough to opposition to give them a fair case to respond to, but also strong enough for government to defend because it's generally just society right now allowing you to own the achievements that you have. So earlier you talked quite a lot about how in terms of framing, it affects people's interactions with society as well as themselves. How would you then convert these frames and contexts into argumentations for government side? So first, I would definitely run a pragmatic discussion on agency. So while it looks like something that's heavily principled, it actually lends itself to a lot of pragmatic benefits as well. If the idea of the collective unconscious did not exist, people would have the ability to determine that the things that they discover, the things that they experience, and the things that they have achieved are entirely their own. And it's something that lends itself to a lot of the motivations that people experience on a day-to-day basis. The more that you feel like your life is your own, the more you feel like you're independent, that you have control over your path, the more empowered you feel in terms of pursuing things that might scare you if you are unsure about the ownership of your life. And I feel like the collective unconscious, when explored, when the idea of it exists, allows for that fear to manifest, allows for that fear of the unknown, 
fear of pursuing things that might not feel like you um, to manifest because it disallows people from actually identifying which pursuits are their own and which pursuits are a result of this collective um, unconscious. So that's definitely one pragmatic discussion I would discuss. And I call it pragmatic because you can use it to analyze multiple levels of how people live their lives, not only in terms of their dreams and aspirations, but also how they proceed with, let's say, relationships, for example, or how they proceed with Um, living with a family or living with friends or going to new places to discover new things. Um, And it's a really important discussion to have in the debate because it it also allows you to see that principled premises can lead to a lot of pragmatic benefits. Another argument that I would run is how the idea of the collective and conscious itself creates a lot of harms when people try to pursue it. So even if the collective and consciousness hasn't been proven to exist or not exist, just the mere idea that it might leads to a lot of people trying to pursue it and trying to discover it. Some people might have good intentions, some people might have bad intentions, but as long as that idea exists, it allows for these individuals to manipulate people into trying to discover it for themselves and trying to use that information to their own advantage. And you can discuss more pragmatic benefits uh, pragmatic benefits to that as well. So you can talk about how people can use this for evil in like cor- on a corporate level, people can use this on a state level to manipulate citizens or even just on a mind game level, like how people can manipulate other people into thinking that the life that they're living isn't something that's valid because it's basically just a reflection of human experiences from the past, that it's basically a life in the previous times or life that has already been lived and is just a reiteration of that or a reflection of that. And it deprives people of that ability to feel like their life is their own. Okay, are there any extensions outside of those arguments that you already mentioned that you could run? If you were, for example, in closing and then you're opening to everything philosophical, everything that you just said, um, even the most creative ones about like manipulation and stuff. If you were put in that worst case scenario, how would you run an extension? Like, is there a feminist extension? <laughs> Ooh, I mean, you can talk about movements. The movements are generally against a large oppressive structure. So how would movements feel if they found out that the reason why they're there is because there's a large oppressive structure in their subconscious that made them all meet there? It removes the idea of choice and agency and like, you know, typical born this way debate na movement. Yeah, oh nga, yung, the, the movement's argument, I feel like it has good potential because I, I'm always the type of person that goes like, oh, we gotta kill God. And I feel like... <laughs> This is one of those times because it it seems like everything was predetermined already. Like, even if you say, I can fight this, I can g- rise beyond the subconscious. The only reason why you're able to do so is because there's something in the subconscious that lets you fight the subconscious. Oh. So it's like, for me, you could run an extension like The Matrix, right? Because in The Matrix, well, in The Matrix... In the first movie, Neo learns that he can rebel against the Matrix, against the system. And in the second one, it turns out that even his forms of rebellion are also part of the system. Mm. So maybe that's something that you could explore on like closing half where you go like, this is so bad because even our attempts to escape oppressive structures, they're still part of the oppressive system that we're trying to escape. Yeah. There is still a God that is determining our destinies. Yeah, well, in this case, it's a, an unconscious, not a god, but still an oppressive structure. So even if you're trying to fight the system, or in this case, fight the subconscious need to be racist, you still cannot credit that as your own achievement because it was still within the subconscious that allowed you to fight that racism. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be a good extension. Yeah, yeah so... I guess we can move on to opposition this time. Um, for opposition, how would you frame the collective unconscious? Because I, I really felt that your case for government was very compelling. So how would you oppose that? Well, the first thing that I would discuss in opposition is that there can never be an assurance that the collective unconscious will ultimately exclusively be used for bad things. I mean, sure, there are evil people in the world who are probably spurred by their own personal collective unconscious, 
But there are also people in the world that try to counteract that negative energy. And I feel like we exist right now in a time where it's easier to counteract negative entities within the world. Like if you look at global conflicts, if you look at um, the state conflict in the Philippines, the drug war or the bad governance, even though there are people that are unaware of how negative this is, there are also people who constantly fight to educate people um, to paint it in a way that is positive or educate people to make sure that they understand that this is something that is negative. So the same way that that exists within status quo, I feel like as opposition, I would also argue that it could exist for the collective unconscious as well. Because aside from it contributing to our actions as people, if we discover that it is real, it's a huge body of knowledge of human experience that we may never see again. If we don't try to access this information, we won't be able to find out information about the past that has been lost because of that old practice of word of mouth preaching where you pass information from person to person. Or the lost books in the libraries of Alexandria, for example, might exist in the collective unconscious. But because we refuse to explore it, or we prefer to live in a world where the idea doesn't exist, therefore inhibiting our ability to explore it, we will never be able to discover the greatest achievements of humanity and the things that we can learn from it. So it's more of a collective approach for the collective unconscious. How does it benefit the greater good of humanity while also making sure that the harms of government is mitigated to the extent that Um, the assurance of evil is something that is self-regulatory or self-correcting in the end. So I think for this debate, right, it's a matter of weighing because both sides seem to have really compelling arguments or really compelling frames. I guess my difficulty with opposition is trying to sort of weigh out all the prospective benefits uh, compared to the more or less assured harms that government, if they ran it strongly or ran it as strongly as you did, um, would be able to pause it for this debate. So how would you outweigh all of those harms with the benefits you just presented? So at, like the first thing that I would do is to mitigate the impact of those harms. So while those are huge harms that government does discuss, I feel like they're like generally speculatory. Like it assumes that people, once they found find out that the collective unconscious exists, will immediately fall into a depressive spiral and say, life does not have any meaning because anything that I've achieved isn't mine anyway. I feel like humans are more complex than that. And opposition can raise that as a point to government in order to water down that discussion. But secondly, I would also com- I would also say that both the benefits of governed op are relatively speculative because there is no way to prove that the collective unconscious is real or not. But if we do manage to prove that the collective unconscious is real in opposition, if we explore that idea and we apply the self-correcting mechanisms that were already established earlier, we're more likely to achieve the benefits instead of living in the dark of the harms that aren't even assured in the world of government. So I would first water down their impacts that way. The next thing that I would do is to establish that the benefits of opposition matter hugely to a huge amount of people compared to the singular harms of government anyway. Um, And the way that I would weigh this is, firstly, I would say that the discussions of opposition revolve around the discovery of the collective unconscious being true and being real and being able like being able to access the collective unconscious and then i would evolve into something somewhat of an analysis that will conclude in the idea that if we discover that the collective unconscious is real we can garner these benefits because we live in a world that understands how information should be handled who should be handling the type of information because the world that opposition lives in is multifaceted and not just one note like the world of government And I would compare it to the world of government and say that while they still don't know that the collective unconscious exists or not, they immediately reject the idea that it does exist and would prefer to live in a world where people are forced to live in a cycle of trying to prove themselves, trying to create things that are new, forced into this responsibility that life is something that they should own. What if people take comfort in the knowledge that life isn't their own, that they didn't do all those hard things by themselves, that they actually have 
people or knowledge that contributed to that. I feel like people would even feel more empowered knowing that they have a huge body of knowledge inside their brains that led them to do these astounding things in the world. So it's it's just a matter of perspective as to how you assess how people will, re- will react. And in opposition, it's easier to prove that people will react positively because it's generally easier to argue that people are multifa- multifaceted and not one note. I, I was thinking of an extension earlier. So I want to run it by you and, and tell me what you think. Because I was thinking like, okay, to be honest, I misheard something you said. Like, what if this is real? And I misheard it as like Israel. And then I was like, are we talking about the Middle East? <laughs> So I was like, mm, actually, what if that's the extension? Like, what if this is the way that we can definitely, definitively answer the question of like, who is more guilty in that conflict? Because like, if if all of the collective human experiences are inherent within each person, right? And theoretically, you could look into yourself and find the truth of many historical debates that might be like, revision the revision like revised right so we're talking about things like slavery we're talking about again like the the israel palestinian conflict we're talking about like world war ii those kinds of things if i ran that to you in a debate would you rate it as below average (laughs) average or above average I mean, I would probably give you an 83. But like, uh, <laughs> that's really good because like that's also one thing that the collective and conscious potentially has. But like again, that would be all lost to the ether if we live in a world where the idea didn't exist, right? So it's more likely that people will, won't be able to know who is right in a certain conflict. But then it also begs the question, do people really want to know who is right in a certain conflict? Or do people want to just figure it out themselves and let the conflict die down? Yeah, I guess that's a very fair question for this debate. Honestly, I'm very interested in the topic and I'd probably like, are you willing to give people a copy of your paper or is that too personal? (laughs) I mean, I could edit it a little bit. Remember, guys, I wrote it when I was in first year college and I was under, okay, so the deadline was like in two hours oh, and no. <laughs> my partner didn't do anything. Oh, so I had no. to go from scratch. So there are a lot of grammatical errors, but maybe an edited version um, could be sent to Nina and Kyle and they could put it under the debatable format to make it look prettier, like put a letterhead and everything. Oh, and wow. maybe, yeah. maybe that can be released. Oh, that would be great. That would be great. I think that it would benefit everyone who probably were in the debate, watch the debate, or are listening to this episode and want to learn more about the debate. So before we end this, um, first of all, I'd like to thank you so much for agreeing to be a motion contributor and for sharing your insights on this motion. I feel like it's a, it's a very innovative motion I've never encountered before. And I'm really excited by the prospects of having new ideas like coming to the debate sphere in general. But before we end, what advice would you give people who struggle with fellow motions such as this one? Because admittedly, this one is a little difficult to grasp at first and it's something that not a lot of people encounter often. I mean, I would say that I feel you. Like the duration of this interview, I was also discovering new things about this motion. And I created this motion. So Philosophy is all about discovering things for the first time or rediscovering things in a new light. So whenever you're given a motion about love, a motion about taking a potion that removes you and ma- removes you, uh, joke lang, retake, <laughs> sorry. Okay, Um. what was I saying? Okay, starting again in three, two, one. I mean, to be honest, I feel you. Like, in the duration of this interview, I found myself discovering things about this motion that I never thought of before. And I was the one who made the motion. So philosophy is generally just that. It's about discovering new things for the first time or being reintroduced to a concept under a new light. So whenever you encounter things such as love motions or a motion about a potion that takes away your emotions and leaves you emotionless. Don't look at it and say, why does this motion exist? Instead, try to assess what that motion represents. Why do people have a tendency to question 
a lot of life's absolutes or quote unquote absolutes. When we live our lives and when we encounter strangers on the street, why do we have an inclination to think, how does their life look like? What do their life experiences look like? What are their futures? Why uh, what, would they be more inclined to pursue a path over another? And why am I not in the same inclination as those people? Those are crucial questions that we constantly ask ourselves, yet we never get the ability to talk about with other people because we feel like they might see us as weird, they might see us as unhinged, or just not want to talk about the more serious things in life. Sometimes feel emotions are the only way that I can express painful experiences in a way that is creative and in a way that is meaningful. And that's what I love about feel emotions. They give you the opportunity to speak your truth in an untruthful way, in a way that hides it, in a way that packages it in a pretty argument, in a pretty piece of characterization. And only you know that that part of yourself exists in the debate. Because feel emotions take pieces of us, makes it more beautiful, and gives it back to us for us to rediscover. So if you struggle with feel emotions, try to ask yourself, what parts of myself have I not discovered yet? That was so beautiful. Thank you so much for, again, agreeing to you, Emotion Contributor. That's it for this episode and this post debate analysis. I hope everyone who listened to this actually learned something, not just about the motion, but also themselves. Bye-bye. Bye.